All right, welcome everybody. It's Rhyme Tovim, Erev Tov, wherever you may be. And it's a pleasure to welcome back after a long absence, uh, Yoetzer Halakha Lori Novik from Efrat. And this, of course, is I'm sure many of you have heard her over the years, taught many of our classes on um, women's in Halakha and in general in Halakha. Uh, Lori is one of, um, just a, a brief introduction. Lori, of course, is one of the early Yoetzer Halakha. I think you've been Yoetzer Halakha for, I don't know, over 20 years yet or um, 20 years? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. about 20 yeah. years, just about. 20 years, there we go. Um, yeah, uh, and she runs, importantly now, she's director and head writer of Dirakeha, uh, which is, deals with issues on women and mitzvot, the project Yeshivat Haritzion with uh, the Stella K. Abraham Baking Drush from women at Migdal Laws in the Israel Kershitsky Virtual Baking Drush. Uh, Lori is a graduate of Yale University. And then when she moved to Israel, she got a uh, master's degree in Talmud from Bar Ilan. And it's a pleasure to welcome her back to Torah in Motion. And it's always harder, maybe it's not right to say, but I think it still is true. It's harder for women in the week before Pesach. So it's really an extra thank you for coming and then sharing some Torah with us. Okay, Vaka Shalori. Thank you so much, Rabbi Jay. It is such a pleasure to be here. I already see some familiar faces. Unfortunately, I don't, I'm not going to spend everyone's time scrolling through, but um, what we'll do, if there's an urgent question, I invite you to ask, but on the whole, I think we'll ask you to put questions in chat. Um, and I probably will not be able to look at them till the end of the year, because otherwise what I've found is it kind of breaks the flow and breaks concentrations. Again, if there's something that's an urgent point, something's really not clear, put yourself out, put your voice out there. Otherwise, Blee Netter, I'd like to get to it at the end and we'll try to leave some room at the end so that so that we can, uh, we can talk about things. Um, and I, I'm, I'm smiling just thinking about this year because uh, I'll put it right out of the table. I love Shira Shirim. I love Shira Shirim. Um, it's beautiful. The poetry speaks to me. Uh, the love story speaks to me. The deeper meanings that have been found, uh, religious, metaphysical in Shira Shirim speak to me. Uh, and, uh, and something that I'm looking forward to in this particular Shira is really just taking the time to understand a little bit. Sometimes what I find is, and, and I understand it, you know, you want to do a big series or get an overarching view of a book, and that's one way to get a sense of what's going on in a Sefer of Tanakh. But sometimes it's actually really helpful to just, to, to choose as it were like a really, a really uh, key representative sample to hone in on that sample. And, you know, sometimes you, you find an infinity in your grain of sand. It can be a lot going on in that very, in that, in that very little bit. And I think that that's definitely true of this pasuk that we're going to be focusing in on today. Um, Shira Shirim Bet Yudal. By the way, Rabbi Jay, um, are you, can you put the link to the um, Makorot? Amazing. Thank I you. Um, and I'm going to do like a, a share screen in a second, but I just I'll talk a little bit more before I disappear. Um, this pasuk is both an extremely significant pasuk in terms of the overarching uh, structure of Shir Shirim. It's, it's something important is happening here. Um, and it's also a pasuk that gets uh, gets explained, and we'll see a lot of different ways of understanding what it's talking about. But one of the classic ways to understand this pasuk ties it directly into the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. So it's also very much not just because we read uh, Shir Shirim uh, typically on Shabbos Cholom Moed Pesach, but also also in terms of how it ties into how we might understand the uh, the Pesach the Pesach story itself. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to share the screen here. It might take me a moment because I what I like to do with the sharing the screen is to give a portion so it's a little bit more um, focused. There we go. Just gonna rearrange my computer so I have what I need to have. And let's just take a moment. Uh, yeah, here we are. And let's just take a moment and 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 hone in on the pasuk. Um, I'm going to start by translating it. You'll see that I left here the cancellation marks because they're also kind of function as a sort of punctuation, and they they'll give us a sense a little bit of how to break up the pasuk. Um, but let's just start it. Start by word by word. Start word by word translating it. And we'll talk a little bit about putting in the context of uh, of what we're up to so far in Shira Shirim, and then we'll, we'll move forward from there. Yonati um, b'chagvei hasela, my dove in the cleft or the the fissure, the crack of the rock, b'seter hamadrega in the hidden area of the cliff, har iniat marai, show me 
your appearance. Hashmi'ini et kolech. Let me hear your voice. Ki kolech arev umar ech nave. Because your song, your voice rather, is pleasing or sweet, and your appearance is beautiful or comely. So again, let's let's try to set the stage of what's going on here within the pasuk, and then we'll just take a short zoom out into Shira Shirim, and we'll come back back to zoom in. Okay. So in the pasuk, we have the the yona, the 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 dode or the beloved man is speaking to his beloved woman, and he's using a metaphor, and he's calling her a yona, a dove. We'll explore what that metaphor means, not just any dove, his dove, right? Possessive. His beloved is his dove, and she's in the cleft of the rock. She's in the hidden part of the cliff. And the first question I would think asking in terms of just on a shot level, what's going on? Why is she in the cleft of the rock? Why is she in? The hidden part of the cliff. Does that signify something? She's hidden, so he can't see her. And he's asking her to show herself. He's asking her to make herself heard. And now we have just, it's just a nice little chiastic structure, right? We started with appearance and then we went into voice. And now we get voice and appearance, right? He inverts the order. And the reason why he wants to hear from her is because her voice is sweet, which is interesting because generally speaking, uh, the Yonah's voice, uh, Yonah's a dove, Yonah's voice is not generally considered to be particularly sweet among birds. But to the beloved, her voice is sweet and her appearance is comely. So she is, as it were, hidden for reasons that are not clear. And the lover, in complementary terms, is trying to draw her out of hiding. Okay, he's trying to he's trying to draw her out, and in particular, he wants to see her, and he wants to hear her, and he's very clear and frank about the fact that that's because he's going to enjoy it. It's going to be pleasurable uh, for him, um, or in his assessment, it's a, it's a, it's good to hear. Okay, where are we in Shira Shirim that this is coming up? Step one. So Shira Shirim at the beginning really starts with the female of our couple being pretty aggressive, right? The beginning of Shira Shirim, I don't have it on the sheet, is Yishakeli min shikot piyu kitavim dadecha miyayin. Kiss me, right, from the um, from the kisses of your lips because it's it's sweeter than wine. And she goes on in that direction. Moshcheni acharecha narutza, pull me, I'm going to run after you. She is aggressively reaching out to the beloved. The beloved's a little bit cagey. Um, if you don't know where I am, you go out and try to figure out where the hurting is. That's where you're going to find me. Um, there's an interlude where it seems that they might be, uh, she also, she describes herself, right? She's hasn't had a chance to tend her own vineyard, Karmisha Lee Lonotarti, which might symbolize not just her vineyard, it might symbolize herself her world, her inner world, could be her physical self, right? She has been in a conflict with her brothers. They sent her, right? They sent her to watch the other vineyards, but she hasn't watched her own. She's very concerned about the vineyard. The vineyard's going to come up for us again soon, so that's important. Um, and then there's this interlude where it's not clear if it's her imagination or if it really happened, that, that, that there, is, there, is, there is a connection um, they're close, and Diglo Alayava, her beloved, is 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 uh, coming over her with love, and she continues to say that now she's lovesick. Right, I'm I'm sick with love, and she needs support, but not to worry. Um, his his left hand is under my head, and his right hand is going to embrace me. And it doesn't sound like he's there to embrace her at that moment in her love sickness, which is why it sounds like maybe when she's talking about they're, they're, they're being united previously, it didn't actually happen yet. It's in her wishful thinking. Um, and then we move into her talking about who her beloved is, who her beloved is and uh, 
and describing and describing some of his qualities. There was a back, there's a back and forth at one point where she's she's saying nice things about him and he as it were responds. And then we have the song, which is where our pasuk comes from. And this song is is starts with her focusing in or honing in on his qualities. And in the middle of the song, he speaks, but it's not exactly him speaking. He's speaking through her words. She's telling us what he said. And here's the exchange. By the way, you'll see on the left column here is our pasuk. Okay. So it's going to be in the middle of this song unit. Shira Shirim is made up of a number of song units. And one of the biggest challenges of understanding Shira Shirim is not just trying to uncover how much of the literal meaning should guide us in understanding what the deeper meaning of the text is, but it's also in trying to understand to what extent there's a narrative structure. Right? Is this an assortment of songs? Is it actually one overarching plot? Or is it something in between, which is, I, I think, probably a more compelling answer that it's a sort of curated and edited assembly. It's, it's, it's giving an overall arc, but not necessarily a point by point narrative plot uh, to this story, which is not just the story that's on the page, but it's also making reference to broader religious tales, which is what we're going to get to. But let's just look a little bit more at the epic shot, at the simple words in context. So this is the song. She starts out by talking about her beloved's voice. Kol dodi, the voice of my beloved, Hinezeba. Behold, it's coming. Medaleg al he'arim, mekapetz al hagvaot. Notice that we have here biblical parallelism. We have two units that parallel each other. He's jumping over the mountains and he's hopping over the hills, okay? And it's an interesting image um, that he's very, he's moving, he's dynamic. Notice later on, we're gonna talk about how he wants to hear her voice. Already here at the beginning of this poem, of this song, she's letting us know that she hears his from afar, right? He's coming and I already hear his voice. He's very active, he's moving towards her. So he's jumping, he's skipping. What's he like? She says that he's like a gazelle or like a young um, stag. And what's he doing when he's not moving? When he's still, he's behind her wall, standing behind her wall. He's looking from the window. He's peeking in through the lattice work. So again, we're really building up, if you think about it, to what we've seen, because her beloved is coming. He's described as being in motion. He's lets his presence be known in advance by his voice. And he's very actively looking for her. Right when he stops motion, it's to seek her out. The tables, almost as it were, were turned. We, we talked briefly about how in the beginning of Shir Shirim, she's sort of more aggressively chasing him. Here it would seem that he's finally coming to to chase her. Um, and now she puts words in his mouth. Anado di the Amarli, my beloved responds, and he speaks to me. He said this to me. Okay, so now I put quote parts here because this is. Her telling us what he says. Kumi lach fati ochilach. Arise, my beautiful partner or beloved one, ochilach. And go. Ochilach should sound a little familiar to you. It's almost like a lech lecha, right? It's the female version of lech lecha. You are stationary. He's been on the move. He's trying to get her to change, to make herself emerge. Because the fall is past, or fall or winter, and the, the, the rain is past, has gone, it's, it's, it's gone away. The blossoms have been seen in the land, the flowers are starting to come out, it's perfect time of year. This is our spring moment. It's one of the reasons we say this on Pesach is because of the connection to spring. The blossoms are being seen in the land. Eight has a mir higia. The time for the songbird has come. The kol hator nishma be'artsenu. Again, we're paralleling, right? And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Notice the, the, the references here to nature 
we're used to the references to nature. We've been seeing the references to nature in terms of metaphors, how the beloved see each other. Um, but here, nature is playing another role. It's as though he's saying spring should be your catalyst. This is the season when you, my beloved, should emerge, right? Why should you emerge? Because just like the, the, the rain is gone, the flowers are coming up, the birds are out. He lists two different birds here who are making noises, making themselves heard, much as he's been heard. He's describing the things that he's seeing in the land around him. There's a way in which um, a very fine teacher who's written extensively on Shira Shirim, of Gabriel uh, Chaim Cohen, talks about Shira Shirim as also being somewhat, not just a love letter about Am Yisrael and Hashem, not just about the beloved, but also a love letter to the land. And you really feel that here, right? It's palpable how connected they are, not just to nature as, as metaphor for themselves, but to the, to the natural world. This is what should get you to come out. Things are being heard and seen in our land. The world is alive with spring. The little green, early growth of the fig has emerged. The, the grapes are beginning to have their little blossom. The small grapes are going to be there and, and, and it gives off a, a smell. Not nureach. So sensorily rich, like the best of poems, right? You can smell it, you can see it, you can hear it. And then he returns to how he began. He started with, and he comes back. He encloses this plea with, he begins and he ends with, arise, right? My beautiful beloved, and get on the move. And his key argument for why he should get on the move is because the time has come. And the time has come is being signaled by nature, by spring, by what he hears, by what he sees, by what he smells. And two of the animal symbols that he evokes are birds making their voices heard. And now it makes a lot of sense that when he next approaches his beloved with a direct appeal, he's bringing up another bird, right? The Yonah. Yonah ti v'chagvea sala. Back to where we started. This is the Yonah, and you are mine, right? There was Hazamir, the songbird. There was Hatur, the turtle dove. But you are my bird. You're my Yonah. We'll talk in a, in a moment about why it's significant that she's a Yonah. V'chagvea sala. Again, in the cleft of the rock, in hiding. And now we see that he really has been building up to this moment of saying she should be seen and she should be heard because her voice is sweet and her appearance is lovely because he's basically saying you belong in this nature. You need to emerge along with the spring. The time has come not just for spring, the time has come for you to let yourself be known. And now with all of this buildup, remember she started, she compared him to the do, to, to the tzvi and to the ofer. She talked about his voice. She built up. She talked about him calling her and what we would expect now. And then he makes a direct appeal again, not just go away, but show me, do this for me, connect with me. And her response is a little bit shocking. The response is, can't, can't do it. Echazu lanu shualim, shualim k'tanim, nechabulim kromim. I told you that we'd come back to the idea of the Karen, the vineyard. She says, we need to catch foxes. There are small foxes, and these are the types of foxes that can do damage to the vineyard, right? We're just working on the shot level so far. These are the foxes that can do damage to the vineyard. And our vineyard is in blossom. It's in bloom. It's in danger. It's interesting. She talked about how her brother set her to watch the vineyards. She talked about how she hadn't guarded her own vineyard. Here we're talking about there's an idea that she has of our vineyard, something that's going to be theirs together within the spring. It's not just that the kfanim are smadar. It's not just that isolated grapes are growing and giving off fragrance. She's correcting him. She's saying, we have a karen. We have something here. We have a place for ourselves, but that place is under threat. It's under threat, and therefore, we have to handle the threat before we can unite. So even after that strong come on, we're not going to unite yet. And then she goes back to talking about her dode. 
He's my beloved, I'm his. He is a shepherd in the Shoshanim. Calling her him a shepherd among the lilies is also very powerful because earlier at the beginning of this chapter, she calls herself a lily. She calls herself Chavetzelet HaShalon, Shoshanat HaAmakim, right? A lily of the valley. And here she says he's a shepherd among the lilies. And there's a little bit of a, a reference to herself. I'm still yours. It's like a reassurance. You called me. I heard the call. You're waiting for me to emerge. I can't because our Karim is in threat. This has to be dealt with first, but still know this is still a reciprocal relationship. You're still mine. I'm still, or rather, he's still mine. I'm still his, even if the time is not right. Until the day kind of gives off, puffs away as it were, the shadows, um, there are different ways of interpreting this, but we could say the shadows go away. It becomes later. So it's not the time for them yet. But until then, what? And then we have this very stunning word here. Earlier, we had that she, he was the dode and he was coming. Now we have this word thrown in. So turn around. Go. It's not our time. He's saying, Kumilach, Lechilach. Harini, Hashmiini, arise, go, show me, make yourself heard by me. And she's ultimately saying to him at the end of the song, turn away. Not yet. The moment hasn't yet come. He's tried to convince her that it's the moment. And she said, it isn't yet the moment. Turn away. Why? Or not why, or rather what he should be. When you go away, Return to being, this is again, just like the internal poem here had a beginning and an end in closing it. The broader poem here also, right? We started toward the beginning with Domedo di Litzviola Ofer Ayali. She says, also when you turn away, you should maintain yourself as this gazelle, as this young stag. And you're going to go al hare Bater, and you're gonna go on the mountains and this question about what Bater means, but it might be something similar to like Greek Bain Habitarim, like the covenant between the parts. The mountains, you could say that they're just geographically, they're split by a valley being between them, but you could also talk about them as being mountains that represent a sort of separation. Right now is not the time for you to come through the mountains. It's time for you to turn away through the mountains that separate us at this time. So we have on a very on a shot level, we have this full sensory account of spring appeal from uh, the woman telling us about the man beseeching her, coming towards her, approaching and beseeching her to emerge and her having to turn him down, but at the same time remaining committed to him and urging him to maintain himself, even though right now is a time of separation. And that's because there are threats at the door. Okay, so that's the shot context. And I want to step back, I want to go back to zooming in now and talk to, for starters, a little bit more about what it means to say that she's a Yona. We know, because he talked about two other birds, that there's no shortage of animals to which they can compare each other. And there, there were two other bird candidates right here. There's the Zamir, there's the Tor. What does it mean that he specifically chooses to call his beloved Yona? And what can, we, what can we get out of that? And the first thing I just want to remind you of, and I think it's actually very telling, is uh, the first appearance of the Yonah in Chumash. And that's from the story of Noah, right? When Noah wants to know when it's going to be safe, when, when the dry land is going to begin to emerge, he starts off by trying to send out the raven, right? The Oriv. That doesn't work. Uh, but then he has much better luck with the Yona. And he actually sends the Yona out three times. He sends the Yona out um, and it comes right back because it has nowhere to go. He sends it out again a week later and it returns with the olive leaf, a little olive branch in its beak. And then one last time he sends out the Yona and it doesn't return to him anymore. And this short narrative about the Yona and how the Yona operates tells us a little bit about how the Yonah is thought of. The Yonah is considered to be a bird, as it were, or, you know, an animal that 
you could say fulfills its mission, um, is loyal, um, is thorough. It's able to fly away, but it's also perhaps cautious about when it's going to go, where it's going to go. Um, in a sense, and this is also something rather dramatic when you start to think about it, the Onana is on some level the first animal to begin to resettle the world. Aside from the fish, of course, but the first animal to resettle the dry land after the flood is the Yona. The Yona is the one that's chosen uh, to begin the, the release of the animals. And also the Yona is pure. It's one of the contrasts actually in the Midrashim when they talk about the Yona versus the Oreb versus the Raven. Uh, the Yona is an animal that can also be brought as a sacrifice. It's considered pure, which in the time of Noah already is a significant difference, right? Because he's bringing different amounts of the different types of animals. So we already are learning a little bit about the Yonah. And it's true, like throughout, um, there's there's a concept that the Yonah was, a, the Yonah in nature is known as being a monogamous bird, um, loyal and monogamous. And I think that kind of uh, rhymes a little bit with this and it rhymes with our story, right? The question is, when is the Yonah, as it were, going to go fly out? But the Yonah can be trusted when it flies out to emerge and do what it needs to do. The Yonah is pure. There are other times we hear about the Yonah. So, for example, in Sefer Yeshayahu, um, when he talks about, um, he's talking about, uh, here he's quoting Chizkiyahu, when the Melech Chizkiyah is sick. Uh, what what does his prayer contain? And Chizkiyahu talks about all kinds of difficult things. It's as though his uh, his bones it feels to him like his bones are being broken, like with a by a lion. It's very dramatic. Um, and then he throws in Ehege kiyona. I would moan or cry out as a bird. And that's also interesting. Back to the coal, right? The voice of the zamir is a voice of song. The voice of the Yonah here, right? It may be a chidush that the lover is saying that the voice of the Yonah is arev, is sweet. That's not what the, the dove is known for. Um, but here, what Chizkiyahu says is that the dove is known for being able to have kind of a mo moaning or pleading voice. Okay, that's something that the dove can represent. Um, we also have the dove, I can't bring you, of course, all the places it comes up in Tanakh, but there's just a, a few interesting suggestive things that, that tell us something. In Yirmiyahu, he talks about uh, the, the, the denizens of Moab, and he says that they should leave their cities, and they should take up residence, Basela. They should take up relevance, residence in the rock, the Yukiona, and you should be like the dove. And you should make your nests in the sides of the edge of the abyss. This idea that the Yonah would be in the cleft of the rock or at the edge of a cliff, hidden in a cliff, it's apparently taken from nature. And your meow is highlighting that. That this is this is where the Yonah chooses to roost, in this kind of this place of precipice. Um, Hosea compares Ephraim to the Yonah in the sense in which it's 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 silly. The he Ephraim ki Yonah pota a petty someone who's uh, who's 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 lightheaded, ain lev who doesn't have wisdom. Um, Mitzrayim karau Asher Allah, who he's explaining what the problem was with Ephraim. Ephraim was seeking help from Mitzrayim and from Ashur. That's his complaint against them. But it's also interesting. The Yonah can be sometimes foolhardy um, in the eyes of Ephraim. That's something we're going to see come up in one of the Midrashim that we're going to look at. Um, and two more quick sukim that I want to look at, and then one more story I want to remind, two more stories I want to remind you of. And we'll fit, kind of finish off our discussion about the Yonah at Sephania at one point talks about the way that Jerusalem has been punished and unfortunately polluted and made dirty. It's got filth on it. The city of Jerusalem, which is called the Dove City. Yona already in Spania, um, not in the context of Shira Shirim, but elsewhere is representing Sion. Right? It's representing Jerusalem, back to that concept of perhaps purity, 
um, and maybe also trustworthiness and patience. Um, it's been dirty, but of course, it's 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 its essence is not. Um, and in Tehillim, David asks at one point that he should have me tamely ever kiona aufa veshkona. I wish that I would have limbs like Iona, wings like Iona to fly away and find a place to be. Iona is a bird that can escape when sorrow comes upon it. And all of these different elements are going to sort of find their way into midrashic attempts to understand what's going on at the heart of this verse. Now, two more broader biblical narratives that I want to remind you of that should also resonate with the Yonah, um, well, or the Yonah on the rock. The first one with Yonah is, of course, the Navi, Yonah ben Amitai. It's not a coincidence that he's named Yonah. If we think about the different elements that we've talked about, right? Think about Yonah. Yonah ben Avi is given a mission. Now, the, 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 the heft of Sefer Yonah is the way in which he finds these kind of hidden places to duck out of his mission, right? Whether he's in the belly of the ship or the belly of the fish. Um, later on in the hot sun, he winds up in the shade of the Kikayon. That he's he's sort of he 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 holds back very often Yonah until he's ready to release and fulfill his divine mission and express what God voices. Um, so that's another another whole world of imagery and thinking about and thinking about the Yonah is somehow not always automatically forthcoming, but potentially being expressive of something very important. Um, with its voice. And one last um, biblical uh, biblical story that I want us to have in the back of our heads before we get into the Midrash readings of this particular verse uh, doesn't talk specifically about the Yonah, but I, and, and I'm actually surprised. I haven't found it yet, but uh, maybe I will someday because um, I would have thought that this would be something that would be dealt, dealt, dwelled on and I, I haven't seen, seen it really dealt with. And that's the story of Moshe Rabbeinu when Hashem appears to him. When Hashem appears to Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem's not able to, it, Moshe's not able to encounter Hashem or to see Hashem head on. Where does Moshe go when Hashem is going to pass by? So it's a different phrasing, Nikrat Hatsur, right? Hashem tells him, Samticha Nikrat Hatsur, I'm putting you in, but it basically means the same thing. I'm putting you, I'm installing you in the cleft of the rock. And at that point, when you're kind of in this hidden space, at that point, I'm going to um, protect you till I pass by. And then, and this is going to be a moment of revelation. This moment of God's revelation to Moshe Rabbeinu is, has to be limited to protect Moshe. And what's interesting is what's being seen is Hashem. Right? Moshe is not, if we're thinking about our Yonah, Moshe is in the cleft. He's not emerging or letting his voice be seen, but he has to be in the cleft of the rock in order to make room for God to be seen. Um, and this is just also a kind of a, a pregnant image from Tanakh that we can have in our heads as we start to think about what might be the deeper meaning of the story. And so what I'm trying to, to, to show here to consider is that is that the Yonah is not an empty image. It's a natural image and it's, it's used in Tanakh in a few different places. And it seems to denote the, 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 the idea that the Yonah would be in the cleft of the rock, the idea that the Yonah would be loyal, the idea that the Yonah would be given a mission, but that it might not always think of the Navi Yonah, might not, easy be, not, might not always be easy to coax that Yonah into fulfilling its mission. And the idea that the voice of the Yona can be expressive of pain. And also the idea that hiding within a rock um, can be protective. And it also sometimes can be something that leaves room for the emergence of God. So all of these ideas, I think, are floating around when we start to think about the Yona in our verse and in Shira Shimri. Okay. Um, without further ado, I want to start moving to the Midrashic readings of our verse. Um, and we're going to start 
with the Mechelta. Um, this is Mechelta is Midrash Halacha and Sefer Shmuel. There are two parallel versions of the Mechelta. Usually, uh, we use Mechelta of Rabbi Ishmael. In this case, we're looking at Mechelta of Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. These Midrashim appear in both in slightly different versions. I like this version a little better. That's the only reason we're looking at this one, but it's in both places. Lama Hayu Lama Hayu Yisrael Domin Beotasha. What were this is from Bishalach, and we're talking about the moment that Am Yisrael stands before the sea, right? Paro is coming from behind, and the sea is before them. Lama Hayu Yisrael Domin Beotasha. What were the children of Israel like at that moment? Leona, they were like a Yona, a dove. Shaparcha mipnei b'nhanitz, a Yona that flew away from a hawk, which is a predatory bird. Nichnesala l'ma'ara l'nakik hasela. And it entered into a cave to a cleft in the rock. Menachash mechonen mifnim mimena. But, you know, there's a snake further inside the cave, um, getting itself ready, uh, nesting, preparing, potentially to attack. Now, she can't go further in because of the snake. Let's say she can't go out because of the Hawk. The so time out. Let's just work out. That's the mashal. Let's work out the nimshal. Right? So what's going to be the yona at Yamsuf? B'nai Israel, right? The children of Israel are the yona. And where is it going into thinking it's going to get safety? Toward the sea, right? The sea, let's say in this case, would be like uh, close to the sea would be the cave, and the sea itself, in all its danger, is the snake. And what's it running away from? The hawk, or we could say Paro's forces, Pharaoh's army, is chasing it. Um, some Midrashim talk about how on either side, it can't go to the sides either, because there's the Midbar, and the Midbar itself is full of snakes and dangerous animals. So at the moment of Kriyat Yamsuf, Am Yisrael is like a Yonah in a cleft of a rock, but in a very unsafe way, in a cleft of a rock. And now, what is, happens in the mashal? And the Yonah would cry out and hit its body, hit, hit its body parts. So that the owner of the dove code the person who owns where she's supposed to be, the Baal Habayit, will hear the Yavo and will come. Who's the Baal Habayit? Who's the person who owns the dove coat in our nimshal? If the parable is that it's the person who takes care of the birds in our, uh, in our real story, who needs to take care of the Onah? God has to relieve her, right? The idea is that the Onah makes noise so that God will take the Yonah out of this tight, dangerous place. So too, when Am Yisrael saw that the sea was closed over, the Sonero Daif, and that there's someone hate, there's someone, uh, an enemy chasing them, they put their eyes toward God in prayer. The Alehen Mufarash Bikabalah, and on them is explained in a tradition based on the scripture, Yonati Bechagve Hasela. There's a verse. Yonati Bechagve Hasela. Um, I, I hear someone, I, I, I don't know if you mean to be speaking or. Okay. Um, because your voice is sweet, Kikole Harev. The tefillah, it's the prayer. 
and your Karen saying this comely indeed. So what's going on here? How are we reading this verse midrashically? If we go back to the verse, we're saying Yonati Bechagvea Sela is Am Yisrael in a tight place. You call it between a rock and a hard place, between a rock and the sea. At Yam Suf. They have nowhere to go and they're in hiding. They're in fear. And har ini et marai hashmi ini et kolech, who would be speaking then? Sounds like God is speaking. And what does God want to hear? He wants to hear the tefillah. Um, one way to understand uh, the song of the sea or to understand the tefillah is that perhaps they didn't just stop in after they redeemed. But the davening begins, and we see this even in verses as well, not of Az Yashir, but in general, davening begins before. Okay, so that's possibility number one. Yonati bechag ve'asela is Yam Suf. Now there are other possibilities. Um, in another section of the Mechilta, they also explore the possibility that what we're talking about, and this is source number two on the second page, what we're talking about is actually not Yam Suf, but Ma'amad Har Sinai the moment that they get to Sinai in the beginning of the Torah. Let's look at how this works. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Ein davar ze amur el har Sinai. This pasuk was not talking about the Yam, like the first opinion that's quoted, but rather this pasuk is talking about Har Sinai. Har ini et mar'aich, when it, when it says, show me your appearance, that's ke'inyan sh'nemar v'yashkem b'boker v'yivem mizbeach ha'chadaha. That they got up, they got, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask everyone to please mute. Um, I think there's someone's named here, Francine, and I, th I think it's your um, your your uh, computer, if you can mute. Um, I actually might, ah, I'm able to do it. Okay, thank you, sorry about that. Um, that they make a that they 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 make a mizbeach under the mountain. That's going to be the way of showing or connecting. That our voice should come with a state with our statement that we're going to do what God has asked us to do. That's after. Afterwards, what happens when they, when they, um, the moment is they're afraid to go too close to the mountain and Hashem accepts it. And he says, Hativu kolasher beru. Everything that they said is good. That's their voice being sweet. Umar ech um, in the culmination, we could say of Harsinai is creating the structure of the Oa Um And at that point, that they come and they present themselves before God. Now, Rabbi Akiva's reading is very different, actually, from the first reading that we had. This is a reading, first of all, the, the readings from the other verses um, around Mamad Har Sinai are not obvious. Um, I don't think this is the kind of thing that we would have been able to, to, to piece together without, without a lot of help. And even once it's here, it's not completely clear. What's the cleft of the rock? Well, perhaps at the very beginning of the source, when it talks in the verses in Shmot and Yitro about them being beneath the mountain, maybe that's akin to being in the cleft of the rock. But then that's a very different type of danger. The danger we're talking about on Yam Suf is an existential danger wrought by enemies on all sides. Um, the danger Rabbi Akiva seems to be talking about at Har Sinai is something different. It's not exactly, it's not really normal danger. It's more um, the way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in, is, is in his awesomeness is overwhelming and in some level generates fear. It's a, it's a different type of situation that would have us, as it were, in the rock. And the prospect is very fine, but when God is calling to hear from us in this case, it's not that God is seeking from us a prayer to save to save us from some immediate existential threat from the outside, but rather what Hashem is interested in hearing is, is our acquiescence, our acceptance 
of the commandments that he's giving us. That's a very different picture. It's plausible within the verses. It gets back to that question, why is the dove in the rock? Is the dove in the rock because that's where a dove nests and the dove is shy? The dove is making room for revelation? Is the dove in the rock because the dove is fearful? Doesn't feel safe emerging. And when it's heard, what's going to be heard is, as it were, a moan or a plea for help. But amazingly enough, this is not by far the last way to try to understand what happens. First of all, there's a parallel. I think for the time constraints, we're not going to be able to do it. There's a parallel version of what we just read from Rabbi Akiva about Mount Parsinai. But moving forward, there's also, and there are parallel versions of this as well, there's another way to understand what's going on, and that it has to do with not a historical event in the far past, but travails of Jews in a way that, uh, depending on how you understand what's happening now, uh, could be very close to the present. Rabbi Yosef Lili Patar Karye Kriya Ben Malchio. Rabbi Yosef Lili solved or explained the verse with uh, with kingdoms or non-Jewish kingdoms in the world, or basically other peoples having dominions over us. Um, that Am Yisrael is hidden in the shadows of foreign powers who control us. And then what do we do? What does it mean to say show ourselves? That's our learning. Hashmi'ini et kolech, make your voice heard. Zema sehatu, that's basically doing mitzvah, a good deed. And then um, it cycles back to kolech arev at the end. It's Talmud, marech navez ma'asetov. But in the middle, it starts talking about how we compare the relative goodness of learning and of good deeds. This is a message that's a little different. When we talk about the verse as referring to the pshat story of the loved one and the beloved, um, we might imagine ourselves into it, but we can think of it almost sometimes as a foreign story. When we think of it in, as Am Yisrael and Hashem in the context of Shirat Hayam, it's a historical moment, a historical moment of threat and Hashem telling us to come out in prayer and connect. When we think about it in Har Sinai, similarly, it's a point in history, differently threatening, threatening in the sense that God's command is overwhelming to us, making room for our voice and acquiescence to God's command, but also in a sense there's, a okay, if we think about Shavuot, we're supposed to experience the giving of the Torah repeatedly, perhaps Shavuot doesn't have a date because it's every day and still. There's a way in which it's pinpointed in the past. Rabbi Yosef Lili is saying, this verse is for all time. This verse is for always. Whenever Am Yisrael is in trouble, not in control, not the, clearly not in control of its destiny, not in the sense of they rely on Hashem, but in the sense of foreign forces that are creating a threat. That's where Hashem wants to see and hear from us. And the thing that we have to do that Hashem has to see and hear is learning and masim tovim. And the dynamic, the dialectic between which is better or how learning should lead us to good deeds is the dynamic that we have to consider when we present ourselves in the world and we stand before Hashem all the time as we navigate troubles. It's not that we were once in the rock. According to this Midrashic reading, we are always in the cleft of the rock. Until, or maybe we're not in some sense now with Am Yisrael, Rishit Smichat Gulatenu, the beginning of redemption, being in, being in Eretz Yisrael. But uh, sometimes that seems easier than, than others, right? It's been, it's been a bumpy few weeks, let's put it that way. Um, but we're potentially in that rock until we've tasted redemption. By the way, there are a lot of Midrashim that also talk about the Yonah somehow being a, har a harbinger connected to Mashiach coming. Um, we're in this moment, 
And we have to look for our voice and we have to look for our appearance and create them in the model of Talmud and good deeds. Um, our time is limited, but I want to just give you a taste. There's more. There are more attempts to understand what's going on with this story. Um, one of them is Rabbi Mayer, who says that actually we're talking about the Ol Moed when the Mishkan is completed. That's Yonati Vichagviya Sela, that we're in the cleft of the Ol Moed. And then it's making ourselves seen as a nation before God and God showing himself to us as well. And then building on that, there's another Midrash that talks about this Pasuk is having to do with Beit HaMikdash. If it can be Ol Moed, it can be Beit HaMikdash as well. And these are about finding a way for us to stand before God and connect with God through Beit HaMikdash, Avodah Korbanot. Um, particularly beautiful one, also apropos of Pesach, is here Zion, connects it to Oleri Galim, people coming on pilgrimage to Yerushalayim. For the, for the festival. How could it work? Um, when we talk about all, all the males need to be seen. Right? So that's what God wants. He wants us to be seen during the festivals. And make our voices heard. He wants halal during the festivals. So there's there's a wide range of, of ways to put this into history. Um, one last, uh, I might do two, but we'll see. At least one last point that I want to make before we kind of summarize um, is something, uh, something extraordinary that happens uh, that happens in one of the Mishnayot talking about uh, talking about uh, this idea of Am Yisrael at the Yom, back to Pesach. And this is here in Shemot Rabbah, towards the end of page two. And it starts by what we saw already. When Am Yisrael sees that they're surrounded, that the sea closes in on them, and the enemy is chasing them, and there were animals in the desert and the wilderness that were threatening them, and they turned to God. And they called out to Hashem. This Midrash asks an extraordinary question. Why did God do this to them? On the reading that Yonatiba Chagvea Sela is not just the Yonah's choice but it's actually that coming up to the Red Sea moment and threat from all sides, this Midrash asks the astonishing question of, why did it have to be that way? Ultimately, a Kaddish Baruch orchestrates everything anyhow. Why is that part of our story? Why should this moment of threat be there? Answer, Elashaya Kaddish Baruch Hu mit'avelet filatan. Hashem wanted their prayers. And we get for this another mashal to explain. Hamar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Lamadavar Demet, what's this like? Lamelech, it's like a king. Shaya Baba Derech. He was coming on his way. He's going along. Vaitab Bat Malachim so eket lo. And there was a princess crying out to him. Bevak Hashem yimachat zireni miyad alisim. Please save me from the robbers. Shama Melech Vitzila, the king heard. And saved her. After a while, he wanted to marry her. He wants to speak to her. And she didn't want. What did the king do? He incited another band of robbers so that she would cry out again. And the king heard. When they came, she started to cry to him. And the king said to her, This is what I was wanting. To hear your voice. So Israel. When they were in Egypt, and they were subjugated by the Egyptians, they started to daven, and casting their eyes on God, and casting their eyes on God, 
it says in Shemot that they cried out from their suffering. Miyad, and immediately, he saw them and he saw their suffering. And he begins to take them out in a strong hand. But he wanted to hear their voice again. The law you wrote seen, and they didn't want. Masa, what did he do? He gira, he provoked Paro, Lirdofa Harim, to chase after them. Shinemar, Paro, he creeped Miyad, he creeped, Paro became close, and then immediately they said Kubne Israel election. They cried out to God again. The Tasha at that moment, Amar Kadish Barhu, God said, that's what I wanted to hear your voice. Shenemar, as it's written, Yanativa Chagvesama. Nashmi ini kola. My dove in the clefts of the rock, hear your, let me hear your voice. It doesn't say, Hashmi ini kol, though. Eno there. Ella, what does it really say? Hashmi ini at kolech. Not just let me hear a voice, let me hear your voice. Shekvar shamati b'misrayim, because I already heard that voice. And that's the voice that I want to hear again. Um, so this adds a whole other dimension to the narrative. When we first talked about the Yonah in Chagvi Asala, the Yonah in the cleft of the rock, um, as being in a hard place at Yom Suf, she was threatened and she chooses to call out to God, right? She was beating on herself to make noise so that he's going to hear, and then he's happy to hear her prayer. But the way that this Midrash draws it out is a little different. And this Midrash is saying, Hashem wanted us to maintain the passionate intensity that we had at the beginning of when we called out to him in the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And it's hard to maintain that level of passionate intensity, but it was important to him that we understand and that we dive in, not just before he starts to save us, but also in the midst of salvation, in the midst of Yad Chazakan Zeron he wants to hear from us. It might well be that Hashem is the one who fought for us. Hashem will fight for you and you'll be silent, but he doesn't fully want us to be silent. He does want to hear our prayer. And ultimately, he also hears our prayer when we're saved. And I'll just add a little parenthetical. Um, and I'll, let me stop sharing and uh, kind of sum things up. And a nice parenthetical is that, um, is that there's another Midrash that you've probably heard of, which talks about why the Imahot, why some of our foremothers had difficulty having children. And the response in that Midrash is that, uh, Again, this idea that Hashem is looking for the prayer of our imahot and wants to hear their prayer. There are different versions, but some of them say the prayer of our imahot. And also there, the verse that's quoted is, hasela, the dove that's in the rock. This verse comes to symbolize Hashem wanting to hear from us with passionate intensity. Um, and it could be Hashem wanting to hear from us with passion and intensity because we're under deep threat. And it can be Hashem wanting to hear from us with passion and intensity because we're ready to accept his law. And it can be Hashem wanting to hear from us with passion and intensity because he's shown up in Ol Moed or in Beit HaMikdash. And we need to be there too. Um, there's a whole world of meanings that we construct around this. But if we go back to our verse and we go back to the poem and we think about it, suddenly the lovers become something much more universal, right? The lovers become this moment of the world is emerging. Spring has come. Sensorily, everything is awake. God is the dode coming over the mountain, skipping, making his voice being heard. And God is seeking us from the rock, whether it's out of fear or out of habit, out of subjugation, wherever we are. Hashem would like to hear our voice. He'd like to hear our prayers. And he'd like to see us. And uh, the way that Rabbi Yossi Aglili said it, he'd like to see us. He'd like to see us realize not just in our learning, but also in our deeds. Hashem wants us to show up with passionate intensity. 
Um, and the question is, how do we answer that call? And even though in the poem that we learned together here, the ending is that the beloved, the Dod, is going to go on the Hare Bater. He's going to go on the mountains, you could say, of separation. Uh, if you look at page three, or I'll just read to you, it's one verse. The very last, uh, the very end of Shira Shirim comes back to that line. And it says, Run, my beloved, um, and be, again, like a gazelle or like a young stag. Al Harib Samin. They're not fully united, but now where's he going? Not to the hills of separation, but to the fragrant hills of spices. Right? There's this idea that this dance, that sometimes we're close and united, but oftentimes we almost miss each other. We have to, we call to God and God calls to us. Okay. So in the end of our particular poem, the at the end of our particular poem, um, what happens is that the uh, the beloved or God has to continue on his way because it's not exactly the right moment. But what happens at the end of the Megillah is we return to that image. And even though it's not clear exactly when it's going to happen, um, the indication is that uh, that this is something that they're going to be, uh, a road they're going to be continuing on together. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to look at chat and see and see what interesting things you had to say. Um, okay, hidden in the cleft of the rock like Moses or Eliza, exactly. So we talked about Moshe Rabbeinu and Eliyahu also is in a cave. It's the idea of hiddenness is so is so poignant. That's I, the, the, this image of what does it mean to come out? For what purpose do we come out? And for what purpose do we hide? Back to Yonah and Avi also, right? Um, are we willing to confront the idea that God can really be out there calling to us? And to know how to respond. Um, is it Chagvei Hasela? Is it the cliffs? Yeah, you're right. Cliffs, clefts of the bedrock. Absolutely. It's actually, it's an interesting word. The root, root, word root, it looks like is Chet Gimel Hei, uh, like Chaga. And then uh, the plural is Chagvei. Rashi says it's like Katsa and Kitzvei. Um, but absolutely, thank you. Um, the Dav Yona without its partner. I'm sorry, I'm not sure where we were. Ah, so we, uh, yeah, so we were talking about the Yona as being united, and then the question is, why isn't the Yona nesting with with its partner in this story? And I think the answer is pretty clear because the Dode or the the, the God is representing the partner here. No, no, um, going back to going back mm -hmm. to Noah, where the Dove doesn't come back, we don't read that Noah sends out its partner. Oh, that's interesting. Well, the dove is a Tahor animal, right? So you, there would be more than one partner for this particular dove. But and without a partner, it can't repopulate the world. It's just a, a loner out there with no purpose. Or, or, it's, uh, or it gets found. Right? Or it's or, obvious that doves are always in pairs because that's the way they always are. I've had some living in my unfinished living room over the past few years. They always <laughs> come as a pair. And then once it, then they make a nest inside like a hole under the roof. And one goes out while the other remains behind sitting on the eggs. And this is the season when they lay eggs. But did, no. but did Noah send out two? We only read that Noah sent out one. Well, we, we, we that's right, but we but if you know what a, what a yona is, then you know that the second one probably followed. Once the first one uh, what didn't come back, the second one probably went and joined them. So that's actually interesting because when it, the yona imagery is used elsewhere in Shira Shirim, and it's it's uh, there's a naich yonim. So sometimes, right, there's the eyes can be compared to like uh, doves together. But one of the interesting, striking things about the use of the Yona imagery in Shira Shirim is, is that it's singular. And on the one hand, we're drawing on this Yona. The Yona is a, is a potent symbol because the Yona usually comes in pairs. And on the other hand, we're specifically choosing throughout Shira Shirim to talk about the Yona as an individual, right? Yonati, Tamati, Achati, 
she's one, she's only. So it, 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 you just, you, you sense this dynamic, right? She's the one because she knows how to be in a pair. But throughout Shira Shireen, she doesn't have her pair. Um, okay, I'm going to continue. So I see, uh, thank you, Asher Stein for, Mr. Stein, for the, uh, for, for going through the different variations. And Kra is not exactly a tzor, is not exactly a sella. This is true. Um, though there's a, they're, they're not super different either, right? It's the, 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 the idea, they're not, we're not talking about a, a, a small stone that's going to roll around. We're talking about some major, either whether it's bedrock or a major slab of rock, something very, very stable that's, you know, a nest could be built in um, and that has claps. But yeah, I appreciate that. The coercion described in the Midrash recalls holding a mountain over their heads at Sinai. What does this do to free will? Yeah, exactly. That's right. And in, in Har Sinai, in the comparison of the story to Har Sinai, there's a there's a line that touches a moment, that that idea that what wh what's the Chagvea Sela? That's the Yona. With the with with God uh, God over its head, and it's it's that's where I was trying to get at with this very complicated idea that I think we tend to run away from, but is very strong and very much shot when we look at what happened at Mara Mara Har Sinai, which is that the encounter with God is terrifying. Right? If we, we don't even have to get to coercive, it is terrifying to have a direct encounter with God. And it's a very complicated thing. And if we talk about in the images of Shira Shirim, it's that, that dynamic, right, of Yira and Ava and how they play out in Shira Shirim, it's not so simple to have that, right? Moshe Rabbeinu has to be in Yikrat Atzur. In Shira Shirim, we're in Chagvea Sela. There's a dance of love, of yearning, but also pulling back and what's going to be the right time and what's not. And... And part of that is that there's something that there, there's also, you know, the other side of love as it were is terror, perhaps. Um, but that also is, um, you're asking about free will. There also, there seems to be, and that, th I mean, that's a broader question, Harsi and I in general, right? Is finding the free will within, within the coercion. And here in Shira Shirim, the, the way that they kind of solved it, at least when they talk about Yam Suf, in particular, and also in Har, in Har Sinai, he wants to hear our voice, he wants to hear our prayer, he wants to hear our acceptance, right? But he wants, it's supposed to come from us. It's this moment, uh, you know, we're forced to the moment where then we make this choice. And the choice is, as it were, to express ourselves, to show up, to do what we're supposed to do. And that's, and that's supposed to, I think, come from within this kind of understanding um, also of confronting what's exciting about love and also on some level, uh, the terror of it, right? right? Many waters can't quench love. It's got the, those flames, which are the flames of, uh, you could read it as flames of God, as it were, right? The consuming flames. And it's, uh, and also the voices, uh, the voices can be compared. Hashmini at Kolech, right? And his voice has been heard at Sinai also. And what are those voices? They're not reassuring uh, uh, love noises, right? And at the sea, um, we give voice, we give voice through Hallel, but, but it comes, it's this, it's this cathartic release of joyous, unified passion and prayer that comes after being being in terrible threat. Um, this is an intense relationship, right? If we have to have a bottom line, and I think your question prompts it very well, is I think it's not supposed to take away um, free will, but I think it does, it does create a tremendous amount of intensity. The stakes can't be higher. Um, okay. Uh, sources are here, English translation. Thank you, that's kind. Does do not cry out, they coo. Coo is better with kolech arev. If a doe moans or coo, coos, is it more is it more sweet? Could be. That's interesting. Thank you. You want Israeli to share Israeli Jays, Israeli mm -hmm. Jays cry out. They squawk. They're very aggressive. A mm -hmm. doe isn't like that at all. Okay. Right. No, a dove is definitely not aggressive. And that's that's part of what's so interesting here. Um, 
I'm, I'm just, uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate the chance to share this with you. Is there anyone else who wants to share something or ask something? So, so yeah, what I want to wish all of us is just, um, there's a few things. I'm, I'm hoping, first of all, that when you hear Shir Ashirim this year, that uh, at least when you get to this pasuk, maybe even before and after, that some things show up for you in a slightly different way. Um, and uh, and beyond that, I think I think there's a call here for us to show up in a relationship with God, with passionate intensity, and uh, God willing, we should try to live up to that. Pesach uh, and beyond. So thank you very much, um, and I hope to see you again soon.